Today we are at the headquarters of our portfolio company Refurb in Vienna, Austria. So Peter, I noticed you don't have any more titles other than founders. So both you and Kilian are founders. Why? What's the story about it? The two of us started together uh, a few years ago in, in, in Shanghai. Actually worked in this whole industry. And then the two of us started talking and we very quickly realized that refurbished products have to be actually part of our future. Now you, you scaled quite a lot. I mean, we're in a larger office and there's <laughs> a lot of people, but uh, uh, the customer satisfaction is still at the yeah. core of the company. So Exactly. It, this, is, this is what we actually learned back then. You recently had a huge round, so it's Series B now going further. Yes, we, we started obviously very small, but we were very ambitious already since day one. We always wanted to be a, a huge company. What's uh, the thing that you think you need to achieve right now to scale faster, to grow? Yeah, it's all about people. We need the best people across Europe, across the world to work with us and want to change the world. Welcome to Almas podcast. This is Tanya Dadashova with Almas Capital and today we are at the headquarters of our portfolio company Refurb in Vienna, Austria. And I have here as a guest uh, Peter Windischhofer, our uh, the the founder of uh, the company. So Peter, I noticed you don't have any more titles other than founder. So both you and Kilian are founders. Why? What's the story about it? Well, you know, when we started the company, both of us did everything. Right? There was no you do that and I do that. This obviously very quickly changed, but at the end of the day, we realized that. We both have you know, very important roles in the company and we also have very important roles to our stakeholders. Kilian is now taking care of everything on the supply side. So it's very important that he is the one face to our suppliers. I do everything on the demand side. So for example, in everything we do in PR, it's very important that I am the face of the company in our Austrian PR, for example, um, and also the face of the company to our investors. And so it just makes it a lot easier. Um, and we just don't have this Ego type that somebody has to be, you know, the, this one person of the company. It's just not how we work. So basically, yeah. both CEOs. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's interesting. Tell us how you actually decided to um, together with Kilian. How how have you decided to start this company? What was the initial vision? Mm -hmm. It actually all started with a with a personal problem of myself. Um, I you know ruined my phone, so I had to get a new one. I didn't want to pay one thousand euros for a new iPhone. I also didn't didn't think it was very sustainable to buy a new iPhone every year. So I bought a, a used one through you know, a peer-to-peer -peer platform. Unfortunately, after three months, it was broken, didn't work again. I didn't have an invoice, obviously didn't have any warranty or anything like that. So I, I had the same problem again. I was, you know, to be honest, very frustrated. Um, I was like, okay, it can't be that way. There has to be a better way to actually buy electronics that are affordable and sustainable. And so that's how I you know, got into researching what are actually options for that and that's how we I landed in refurbished products. Then I realized that Kilian, the two of us started together uh, a few years ago in, in, in Shanghai, actually worked in this whole industry. And then the two of us started talking and we very quickly realized that refurbished products have to be actually part of our future. We have to bring refurbished products in the middle of our society because we believe that it is so important for us to reuse products that are already there um, and not produce everything from scratch because if we want to change climate, our climate in a positive way, then we have to change the way we consume. So when you decided to create this company, you were actually in Shanghai. How, how did mm. you choose the geography? No, we were. Uh, so I was already in, in Vienna. Kilian and I together studied in Shanghai you know, a couple of years ago before that. Um, then he went back to Germany. I went back to Austria. I started my career with McKinsey. We worked on big marketplaces. Uh, he worked for Amazon and built the whole refurbished products program for Amazon in Germany. Um, and then after I had this you know, personal situation with this broken phone, I decided, hey, let's do something about this. And then I got Kilian on board and also Jürgen, our third co-founder and our CTO. And the three of us really talked about what we want to achieve in our life. And sort of the, the, the thing that really united us is that we wanted to achieve something that changes the world and makes the world a better place. And we strongly believe that this is the, the mission of, of us as founders and the whole company to make our world a better place in the way that we want to make consumption sustainable. So you started basically the three of you, so you didn't yeah. have a big team. You started yeah. to, to already to uh, 
find the right fit for the product, right? Yeah. So very agile, very startup life. So any interesting stories happen there? Um, yeah, you know how it is in the beginning of a company, you do everything, right? Um, in the early days, I was in a program on the website, I was doing marketing, I was running ads, but I also did customer service and all of us did customer service. And to be honest, I think it was extremely important because it really got us extremely close to our customers and it really helped us understand what actually motivated them. Um, pretty funny story is that we didn't just pick my personal phone number as our customer service hotline because we didn't have the money to actually have this you know, special number. And so people would just call me randomly. And was during the day I had a lot of calls because they, you know, a lot of people buying the products and were happy and we wanted to have uh, contact with the people. But it also ended up having a lot of calls in my free time. <laughs> and once there was a situation where actually I was uh, at a party on a Saturday night, it was midnight on a dance floor and somebody called me and I, I thought, you know, it might be some of my friends. So I picked up the phone and it was actually a customer who had a problem with the product. And so actually I tried to help the customer while being on the dance floor, um, which was you know very a very good example of how much we cared and how much we we wanted to make it work to give everything we have in every moment in every situation, and it really helped us understand our customers. And I think it's so important for every founder if you build a business, try to be as close to your customer, and that's the most important thing. You know, more important than anything else is understand your customer, understand why they're buying, understand their problems, understand their, also their happy emotions, right? Like, cause most customers are really happy about it. And it helped us really also shape the strategy and our go to market strategy and how, how we actually acquire customers through being that close to them. Yeah. And I think now you, you scaled quite a lot. I mean, we're in a larger office and there's <laughs> a lot of people, but uh, uh, the customer satisfaction is still at the yeah. core of the company. So exactly. This is, this is what we actually learned back then through talking to our customers because we understood that our customers, when they're happy, they really like the story, they really like the product, and then they want to tell their friends and family. Right? They're very, very active about that. And for that, we actually saw that a lot of our customers came through these referrals. So they came through word of mouth. And so we made it an integral part of our strategy to always put the customer first, always put the customer happiness first, because we knew if we do that, we're going to achieve growth basically by itself because our biggest growth channel right now are referral customers. And actually, I think it's, uh, it, it's uh, it, it, of course, it's, uh, it brings you growth, but I think uh, this, uh, uh, your customers and uh, the, way, the way it is, it's uh, not just having more of them, but it's educating people that it's possible. Mm. That uh, it, Just like in your personal example, you didn't yeah. know that it's possible to get a phone that is almost mm. like new refurbished yeah so uh, I think uh, it's it's a very interesting trend nowadays and uh, that uh, people learn and know that it's possible to mm. get the refurbished phones and in in Europe you can get them from another country right so basically it's an yeah. international marketplace so exactly. you don't even need to go to yeah. some local peer-to-peer -peer platform you get an international shipment mm -hmm. exactly what and I think we realized what was very important for our customers from these early days is that they want to have this risk-free but great customer experience, which means we, they just don't want to, you know, hassle with somebody like on a peer-to-peer -peer platform. They don't want to have any, you know, uh, friction in this whole process. So what we did is we made it very simple. We took out all the friction for them and made it very simple for them to actually buy the product, which means they just have to select the product and we take care of selecting the right merchant, selecting the right quality and making sure that the product works. And so the customer has a very simple uh, customer experience you know, that's ultimately helped us a lot in creating a great uh, customer experience and customer happiness. So uh, any anything that changed in the terms of your vision on the way because you learned something that doesn't work, does work, so mm -hmm. scaling, maybe there were different experience scaling from zero to one and now going yeah. further because I mean you, you recently had a huge round so it's Series B now going further. Yeah. Yes, we we started obviously very small, but we were very ambitious already since day one. We always wanted to be a huge company. I think what changed is that we got a much bigger vision by now, which is not just a marketplace in, you know, for example, Germany or Austria, but we want to be in a pan-European or even a global company and offering all sorts of products, not just phones and laptops, but we also have a lot, a lot more uh, electronic devices um, and might even go beyond that. And I think this is something that really developed 
also again coming back to the point but just talking to our customers okay so any anything that didn't work so yeah there, there are hundreds of things that you know didn't work hundreds of small things a couple of big things not every expansion was successful not every new business idea we had was successful but what we really learned from all of that is that we have to have a process to be very simple for us to find out whether or not the hypothesis behind a new geography or a new service actually makes sense and this is something we really learned that we have to prototype something very quickly get it on the market as soon as possible and then test it live with real customers because ultimately all the research that we did in the past was always you know great that we have it but didn't really answer the question whether or not a new business actually works yeah. and so for that it's always trial and error yeah experiment culture actually we love that yeah. as VCs. yeah exactly <laughs> yeah so uh, does it get harder or easier when the company grows larger so was it simpler to do experiments when it's five person team mm. now when it's uh, over 100 i don't think it's it's a simpler or easy or like harder question it's just very different right we get more stuff down but obviously it's much more complex because we already have structures in place and we already have technologies in place and some of them you know enable us to be really fast and some of them you know are just there to scale the company and that obviously doesn't make it so simple to change things so it's not really harder or, or, or easier it's really about you need different people and different mindset in the scaling phase we're in right now than we needed uh, two three years ago yeah for sure so uh, what's your personal struggle what's uh, the thing that you think you need to achieve right now to scale faster to grow yeah it's all about people we need the best people across europe across the world to work with us and want to change the world and really give everything they, they have because ultimately we as a company our only asset are the best people and that's what we need to do in order to get the best people we need to provide a great company culture we need to provide you know tell them that what we want to achieve and make sure that they understand the mission that we have and enable them to do their best work. And that's obviously something that we're actively working on and um, it's something that's not super easy if we go through scaling and you know doubling basically the amount, number of employees every year. Everything changes all the time, but we have to find a process around that. So your potential employees are like your customers. You need to deliver to them the exactly. brand, the mission, everything. Yeah. So they want to join and to work on the same goal. Exactly. And we also you know have a very similar approach to that, right? We always ask our employees how happy they are, what's good, what's bad, get their feedback on things, but also get their ideas on how to develop as a company. Um, and something that's very important for us as, as founders that our, our people are happy, but obviously also for the business, obviously equally important. Yeah, so I think it's um, anybody who wants to support this goal, you have an opportunity to join the company. Yeah. So from any European country, right? So you are yeah, quite global. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, so again, you have been on this journey for a while. You have different investors joining, so it's yeah. not just internal struggles. It's also learning probably to work with uh, different type of investors, from mm -hmm. early stage angels to like uh, Series B growth investors. Yeah. What any learning there? Any anything that you didn't expect? Um, yeah, I think one thing that is that is great about our setup is that we have different people for different topics. Right, our business angels that started basically the company with us a few years ago, most of them are entrepreneurs themselves, and it's you know, great to talk with them about the daily struggle, the growth investors that just came in. It's great to talk with them about the strategy for the next three, four years, right? And so what we do is we just sort of cherry pick what we can get from which investor, and they're very picky about that and get the best inputs that you know, make the most sense for us. But I think what you managed to do great is to have this forum when, when, where all the investors could mm -hmm. also participate and share their vision. And uh, you, you have from the very beginning be sharing a lot of information like regularly every month yeah. with the investors. But was it your initial plan? You, 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 you had this in mind that it's something you need or it just happened naturally? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it was just happening naturally and, you know, there are basically two reasons for this, right? One is the more information you share, the more engaged they are and the better input you get. And the second is the better informed they are, the less you know calls you get in the middle of the night and ask questions like, what's happening? Why is that happening? It's, you know, I, I, 
I think a win-win for everybody. It makes everything more efficient and it adds more value for everybody. Yeah, I think as an, as an investor, I can say that it was actually very, very good experience knowing everything that's happening and we are your, your, your help actually. So yeah, if, uh, exactly. you, you need to use us in the right yeah. way. And I think it was a very transparent communication in this regards. So if, if it, you manage to keep it further with growth investors and uh, next rounds, I think it's a very good advice for, for other startups. Yeah. So anything you would do differently. So if you could, looking back, something that uh, you, you, you will approach in a different mm. way? Yeah, I think we, we started international expansion very early on. Um, and obviously we learned a lot along the way, but if we would do it again, I would focus on the core markets first, focus more on getting the product right, getting, you know, focus more on growing there, and then going into new markets afterwards because you increase complexity uh, exponentially with new markets and new businesses that is just slowing you down in the process yeah but but actually it's it but when you have this growth happening sometimes it's very hard to to, to say no yeah so I mean it's, it's not like you enter in a new market and it's so so mm. I think uh, every time the um, the start was very like fast no absolutely right I mean so <laughs> we, were very, we were very so successful in that but at the end of the day um, there's a famous quote that I, I really like because it's so simple strategy is about not doing things and that's I think very true it's about really prioritizing and making sure that you do the things that matter the most um, and you know early days in the company we could have invested the money in a different way that you know might have led to an even better out outcome but at the end of the day I think it was still interesting learnings and helped us a lot in now expanding to the new markets that we afterwards did. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's for sure. I think the focus on the early stages is more important and you will always have time for experimenting with new markets yeah. once you get to, to the later stages and get more funding and yeah. everything. Uh, so uh, what's, uh, what's uh, your uh, plan? What's your vision uh, going forward? Is it geography wise? As you mm -hmm. said, you uh, still thinking about some expansion. Yeah. Um, what, what's your vision for the company for the next mm -hmm. years? Yeah, we are, we're very ambitious. <laughs> you like that? So. Yeah, uh, so we have big plans and we always think about three different levels of expansion. One is of course geographic expansion. We're now, I think in eight markets, we want to go into another two to three in the coming months. The second level is product categories, right? We had historically a very strong focus on phones, got now a lot more laptops, tablets in, but also other electronics and even non-electronic products. So there's just a lot we can do. And the third one is around business model innovation. For example, we just started uh, offering people the opportunity to sell back their products to our merchants. Which is great because less phones lying around in people's drawers and more supply in our marketplace. And so stuff like that is very important for us to increase the value we generate for both sides of our marketplace. And this is the third angle for us of, of expansion and growth. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, to actually it's good for merchants. It's good to, to have more supply on your side, yeah. but it's also like completing the the vision of sustainability, yeah. right? So you exactly. get the whole uh, yeah. from, from from the whole value chain. Yeah. yeah. So that's a. Uh, I think that's a great mission you have. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for sharing it today with us and all all the luck and uh, your plans. We're happy to be to to support you in anything you need to to achieve them. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you.